<laughs> Hi, Yang. Welcome to another um, artwork and philosophy, oh, possibly hard work, ag agreements and philosophy, i.e. happy guild. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and it is uh, October 10th. I want to take the opportunity to wish a happy birthday to my sister, Mediterais, today. And... Um, um, and may I may I request of uh, Bennett to uh, share screen mm -hmm. and so that we can access the agenda for the meeting. And uh, I'm going to do something a little bit out of order because every time when we get to the note taker part, we ask Ben, thank you for taking the notes. So I'm going to start at the beginning. Ben, would you kindly um, uh, do your magic note making? Because I think out of the three of us, you're the only one who can really do it well. <laughs> <laughs> More than happy to. Thank you. Um, and uh, would someone like to do the land acknowledgement and potentially also the check-in? Well, I could do the check-in and grounding because I have a a clever question and okay. we'll do a short grounding after that. Could, can we ask our colleague Ben to do the land acknowledgement? Also happy to. Um, <clears throat> so we start by acknowledging the land as a reminder that um, we center the land to decenter the ego. We heal the land to heal the, we, we take care of the land to heal the people and we heal the people to take care of the land. And um, we start by acknowledging the land as a way of acknowledging all of our relations and all of our interconnections. And as a reminder to be good ancestors and be good relations, um, to set some context on why we are even bothering to show up here in this place at this time. Um, because we show up because the land calls us to be here. And in doing so, we acknowledge a deep debt of gratitude to indigenous cultures around the world who have discovered this and learned how to live by this principle and retained it in the face of great obstacles and outright aggression and um, who are still working to bring this understanding back to the world and keep it alive in the world. And so this is also a reminder that we all have work to do in repairing our relationships, repairing where harm has happened in at any level of all of our relations. Um, so repairing our relationship right front down to the microorganisms in the soil, caring for their environment, right up to our neighbors who have been at the receiving end of a lot of the aggression and harm of capitalism and colonialism and isms of any nature. And um, so with that, I pass over and I will acknowledge specifically um, uh, that we are uh, not only on the territory of the Wissanic, but in the neighboring territories of the Cowichan and the P Penelicut and, um, and the other Coast Salish people who are relations to each other and neighbors to us all. So with that, I pass over to April to do a little check-in and grounding. Thanks, Ben. And just to do an acknowledgement of the land where I am currently. I'm on the other side of the Salish Sea from uh, Ben and Roland, and, uh, but with groups who are related to the groups that you have referenced, Ben, and uh, that would be the Sea Shalast Nation, part of the Coast Salish uh, group, and likewise, um, stewards of the land and stewards of living well and collectively within the environment. 
And my check-in question kind of relates to the environment and to the land, and that is, what are you smelling when you're outside these days that tells you that it is the fall, the autumn of the year? And have we established a circle for today? Uh, on my screen, it is Ben and then me, and then April. Okay. So, Ben, what are you smelling that mm. tells you that it's this time of year? It depends on when I go out. If I go out in the morning, I smell wood smoke. And that tells me what time of the year it is. And actually, I guess because it also tells me what time of the year it is, because when I go out later in the day, I don't smell wood smoke because... We only are using a little bit of a fire in the morning to to take the chill off. And the other thing that I am definitely smelling um, is uh, leaves. the The big leaf maple leaves are falling, and and there is that fresh, yeah. fallen leaf smell, um, which is lovely. Um, so that's what I'm smelling. Over to you, Valan. Um. Um, uh, the chicken house. Uh, in the in the summer, we use the uh, deep litter method because the uh, air is so dry that it works perfectly. Uh, and so the deep litter method is when you keep adding on top instead of removing and replacing. Um, so it allows for stuff to uh, collect in uh, on the bottom. Uh, but when the air starts to get damp in the fall and in the winter, it uh, the the stuff on the bottom absorbs the moisture, and so you start to get aroma, which is an aroma that you don't want in your chicken house. So that's how I know it's fall. Uh, over to April. Well, the way I know it's. Fall, as I realize that there's there's a number of cues for me. There is the the beginning of leaf mold, but more than that, in my yard and only feet from where I'm sitting, uh, there is bear poop, <laughs> which has a particular consistency and and smell to it, not entirely unpleasant, uh, but very earthy. And then only a few yards farther on from my house is a salmon spawning stream and right now we're in the third run of different kinds of salmon for this fall and there's lots of dead salmon around so you smell dead salmon which again it just seems entirely appropriate and it's this time of year that that happens so Let's just take a few moments now to um, to ground ourselves. So I would invite you wherever it is that you're sitting to just relax into the position, put your feet flat on the floor, uh, let your arms and hands hang down, let your shoulders relax down. And just be aware of being supported where you're sitting and then in the building where you are and sinking down farther into the floor and through the floor onto the land and feeling that your feet and your body is rooted in that land. And with that feeling, just check your breath and your breathing. So take a deep breath inwards. And let it go. And again, focusing on your breath, a deep breath in. and letting it out. 
And as you breathe in, just be aware of your environment and the smells and the sounds. <laughs> and of the feel through your hands, wherever they are. Breathe it all in, and then as you exhale, let go of any moments of tension or stress that you're experiencing. Being aware of the breath coming in over your tongue, down your throat, into your lungs. And then as you exhale, be aware of that little feeling of relaxation, that little feeling of warmth. And finally, as you breathe in, just become aware again of where you're sitting. Give a little wiggle to your toes and flex your fingers. And count backwards three, two, one, and join us again here in this circle. And I think next up is agreements. Do you want to go over those, Roland? Sure. Um, agreements that we're all very familiar with. We're all in this together. And that, that uh, means that we can use we language instead of you language when we're talking about ideas and things to do. Um, uh, we have choice. Choices have consequences, um, and an also and kind of way. Um, we lead with curiosity, kindness, patience, compassion, and gentleness, and we listen for understanding both inwardly and outwardly. Uh, we speak from the heart. What's true for you in this moment? Um, so both and, also and, instead of either or, um, that there's all sorts of different uh, elements to anything. Um, have fun, find the humor, keep it simple. Um, and a reminder that the session is recorded. Um, we'll have an opportunity to go to ask the other two members, but I think um, we're all fine with this being recorded and uploaded to YouTube for public consumption um, and uh, public consumption so that whoever's watching can also participate uh, by commenting. And um, so I open it up. Do you have any questions, any concerns, or anything to add to the agreements for this meeting? And we'll start with Ben. Nope. How are you, April? Um, I agree with what we have here, and I, I was just really reflecting that that sentence about we are all in this together just is a huge relief for me whenever I hear it. And it helps me to summon up compassion, compassion in a way I wouldn't be able to otherwise. It would mm. be false sometimes but it just allows me to sink into the fact that we are all together. And if we are, then I need to share out what, what it is that I want to get in, I guess. And over to Ben. Mm, no, back to Roland, I guess. Back to Roland. Yeah, we can uh, um, go to just go over what the primary function of the guild is. And uh, it's interesting. I'll give you just a, a moment to read. It's interesting to see the, um, I guess, the keywords 
below uh, on the, in the second point and looking at the um, the phrase or the sentence that describes the the uh, the primary functions and uh, yeah okay so then the main responsibilities um, I can go over it or I'm going to open it to see if either of you would like to go over the main responsibilities of this guild. Uh, I will, if you like. Okay. So it references above that the, the guild is the emotional heart. And, and so if we are the emotional heart, that means it has implications that follow um, building and deepening relationships internal to the academy. So relationships amongst and between uh, those of us that are uh, often work in the background and are internal to, to what is what goes on often. Um, it also means bringing the joy and making sure that we don't lose sight of that. Sometimes I get really grim about trying to reach my goals and I keep bearing down, but in all of this, working harder at the same things is not necessarily the way to do things. Understanding that the joy needs to be the punctuation really in, in our work and looking for spaces and places to do conviviality and celebrations. Um, the connection and reconnection with the land and all of our relations is really important and that can be called experimental spirituality but but it can be called lots of other things as well and that in itself can lead to personal healing and the grief work and the fact that we are invited to make that part of what we work with is really really refreshing not always easy but really refreshing and this guild is kind of a monitor of how the heart is going in other meetings and activities, and what are the vibes that we're feeling with that, using that as a lens. We also are the keeper of the circle process, which is why we're trying to be um, cognizant of who speaks when in the circle and how it is that we take on and demonstrate the agreements, which is our philosophy. So responsibilities therein include facilitation and education where possible and shared with other guilds as it makes sense to and making sense of our experience as we go on and developing discernment, helping to develop this so that what needs to be surfaced is surfaced through our work. Anything to add from uh, Roland or Ben? I think that was very good. I have nothing to add. Okay. Ben is shaking his head, so he has nothing to add either. So I guess now we move on to taking a look at what our priorities might be for today. Yes. Um, and we had as an action item from the last meeting to uh, forget the wording but it was to reflect on lessons learned um to um help uh start uh to prepare to for the next what are we calling it quarter no semester season season quarter mm -hmm. period yeah. <laughs> oh Add a add link for privacy safe statement. Right there, we do have a privacy statement for the YouTube recordings now. So good point. Um, so uh, we have uh, action items from the last meeting, and then there's the uh, the uh, is there uh, so anything else in terms of. Anything carried over from the last meeting that you can think of, April? I, I don't think so, except, well, you've already mentioned the, the badges. We did have a bit of a 
a discussing discussion about what that might be. And I think we had a certain amount of levity around badges as well. And hats, I think. Um, but I can't think of anything else. So over to Ben. Um, well, I don't think I have anything from the last meeting, and I am wondering if it is also uh, worthwhile to say, how do we want to use this time? Um, what are we hoping to get out of this time together? And and I'm gonna I, I'm gonna start by I, I am looking and we are over twenty minutes into the meeting and we're just getting to study, setting the agenda. Um, so I I'm wondering about I, I think this might be lessons learned moving forward. Um, uh, how that this might be something that goes in that conversation. So um, uh, and should I add in terms of our agenda? So we have Heartwork Guild definition and responsibilities as the first item, and I'm, I'm assuming that that is kind of reflections on lessons learned. Is that what that intention is? Uh, yes. All right, and um, and we can have an update on the last uh, connect the dots, and. Um, and then we still have the hard work. So um, that's, I think I'm I'm good with that. So I pass to Roland, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, so uh, uh, anything, uh, anything that, so, okay. Mm -hmm. I think we've already started. I was going to also ask if there was anything to add to the agenda. So Ben, you've added a few things. Um, and uh, April, is there anything that you'd like to add to the agenda? No, I was going to add what Ben added. So I'm good with that. Thank you. Uh, that's awesome. So we are of one mind. Uh, so uh, I guess now the uh, question is, in which order do we want to talk about things? Um, if you'd like to, if, if this order is good, give me a thumbs up. If you'd like to shift anything around, let me know. Um, I would prefer if we just did a real quick update on the Connect the Dots Club and then move to the other, the other things. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. You can go on while I'm doing this. Okay, uh, so we were all at the last Connect the Dot Dots Club meeting. Um, what kind of update? Is it an update, or is there is it is it sort of a little bit what the next point is, which is lessons learned and reflections, or what what would we like to talk about in terms of the wrapping that up? Um, April. Uh, well, I think impressions as to how it went, as to how we felt about it, um, what we were left with, really, and then maybe some indication of if and when we're going to do it again. So we're doing it in rounds. Are you passing to Ben? Yes, sorry, passing to Ben. All right. Um, my impressions, and I, I thought I've been thinking about a number of things um, because of two things that are on my desk right now. One is thinking through the bylaws, uh, finalizing our bylaws for incorporation as a co-op, and um, uh, medium posts, which are setting up the what is it that we're actually trying to do for, you know, as part of the academy. And so I had, for me, the, the last event we did where um, we got a chance to share our main, like our foundational resources and then vote on the board 
seems to me that that is the next, the first thing that happens. So all of that I've been kind of couching in thinking about our 2025 cohort, the people, the lifeboat builders who are going to be joining the academy in January. And so I've been thinking about the whole year, 2025, as, you know, how would we support lifeboat builders over the space of the year? And, and I think what we ended up with on Tuesday is what we start with for the new lifeboat builders. And, and I think that it involves bringing people in, having everyone, bef like you basically have homework before you start at the academy that among other things, it basically is your, your quick project plan, um, which includes your North Star, which includes your book report. What are three to five resources that have been instrumental in shaping how you're thinking about building a lifeboat and why? And then one of the first things that happens when the cohort bring, comes together is we review the, the Miro board and our bubbles and some of the things that are there. People are given a chance to add any of their three to five foundational resources, which aren't on the board already. We all get a chance to share what our favorite resources are and why. And then we vote a fresh voting exercise where people, and it's all the cohort doing it for the cohort, what are the resources that are most interesting? And from that then, it's, we've been talking about developing a syllabus. And I think it's actually at that point, people develop their own syllabus. Yeah. So each each person gets to say, based on what people are talking about, and I think that it's, um, and, and I think that there's a two-parter to this. Um, people get to say, you know, I'm really curious about this, you know, everyone kept mentioning this book and that sounds really cool and I want to know more about it. And likewise, what are the things where we want to do a deeper dive or we're so excited about it, we want to tell other people. And I think that creates a perfect peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, who wants to talk about a resource and then they lead a discussion where people who are interested come in and people who have experience talk about it. And um, so, yeah, I felt like that was, I, I think the whole thing was really good. I enjoyed the whole part of it. And then there was just this moment of like, at the end, for me, it was like, this is the thing that we can keep building on. Um, and I think it's because that is, it also weaves together. The other part of the takeaway is, I think I have a much better sense of what, um, you know, we keep talking about, we're trying to build what comes next. What does education look like in the next form, as opposed to somebody showing up with a syllabus and saying, here's what you need to know. You know, I'm the expert here, you know, you need to know these things. And it's a balance. It's the both and, because there is something about making sure people are aware of some prerequisites but then within that frame, it's about just creating opportunities where people can share, here's what I'm excited that I've learned and want to share with people. And here's where I'm currently wanting to learn. So um, long-winded, but um, I think just a sign of, I felt like that was really meaty. I felt like that last bit was really meaty. So um, that's those are my reflections over to you, Roland. Uh, yeah, and I, I kind of think about um, that the, um, is there uh, an abridged version of the mapping the territory, um, connect the dots club uh, series that would be sort of the introduction of a, um, uh, a circle of, uh, I feel so fancy using the word cohort for some reason, the cohort, uh, the spring cohort um, to, um, to co-create the syllabus 
for for the course. Um, and I was also really curious about um, the uh, the uh, April you talked about uh, enjoying fireside or something along those lines. And um, uh, anyway, I'm I'm curious about that if that was suggesting um, uh, something or reflecting on what, uh, the way things were happening. I wasn't, I wasn't quite clear. And, um, and I'm curious to see if it's something that could lead into something else. Uh, so uh, over to April. Well, I'm going to respond to, to Roland first and then a couple of other things that have occurred to me. Um, I, I think the idea of people sitting around a fire in a safe place and telling stories is at the root of, of much of what I do and of much of what I understand of the human condition. And so whatever our version of that can be, I'm going to be doing that anyway, probably. And... Uh, it just kind of creates, I think, the right the right ambience to settle into. Now, we've already been creating that, creating a safe space, creating a creative space, creating a co-creative space, and, and referencing lots of important work that's gone before. All of those things happened in our sessions, but I think think this is just another an adjunct to that in a way um really it's sitting around together around some some source of of warmth and something to look at that you can lose yourself in and uh, uh and sharing and out of that sharing builds a culture and and a way of being really i think so that's a long answer to your short question roland um, I haven't thought any further than that about that. Uh, what I what I wanted to mention that has sort of stuck with me is is um, that what we came up with both for criteria and then for the final session and for what our takeaways were for the final session was much more both coherent and integrated than I ever expected it could be. So I'm used to when I'm looking at criteria or constraints or design for a particular thing to kind of have a list of a laundry list. And this went far beyond being a laundry list. It took the laundry and entwined them all and hung them together on a line and then mixed them up and, and uh, um, created something else out of what was there. So it was generative and it was uh, emergent, I guess. Um, so that struck me. And it also, I got a sense at the end that this is all a living, a living library and a living document and that it will change with each iteration. And in some ways, the, the metaphor that popped into my head is it's like the stews that I make, particularly in the fall, where you throw together possibly the same kind of ingredients, but what comes out is always a different smell, a different taste, and to keep things from getting stuck instead of kind of percolating away and creating something else is you stir it a little bit. And that's, I think, partly what we're doing now. It's what we'll do when we talk to the new cohort in the spring is that we will say, look, we've got a big pot full of all this stuff. Let's stir it and see what happens. We can be sure that it kind of smells good already, that it's full of nutrition and that um, it will morph and change, I guess. So I somehow have a, a strong sense of that. Um, the well and just the fact that the whole thing was pretty enjoyable and lots of it was a bit unexpected so that's quite fun for me that makes a sense of play and over to 
Ben, again? We'll just do two rounds. Okay. Um, well, yeah, and I'm grateful for the second round because um, there were two things that popped up. One, April building on, on the stew metaphor. And I think, I was thinking it's more uh, like a sourdough starter, you know, that because there's something about how, you know, there's some element of it that kind of keeps alive from, you know, and that it matures, yeah. but it also stabilizes. Like I would expect that this will always morph slightly, but I think that the core without, uh, you know, ossifying, I think that there's going to be some stability and that's making me think a lot because of the medium post that I just wrote, I was trying to get at the essence of what is, what does it mean to build a lifeboat? And one of our sayings is it, it building the lifeboat is the lifeboat. Yeah. And this idea of this ongoing process, but what you were saying made me think that it's, it's, you know, the both and is about the back and forthness of it. So there's something, there's something, there's a model. And I think it really is. There's a model that we're building and we test the eye. So there's a, an abstract platonic idealized how it could be. Mm -hmm. And then there's giving that a shot. And, uh, you know, the, we talk about uh, reflection being experience and expectation and how both of those need to be changing. So it's not like one is right and the other is wrong, that it's this constantly back and forth and back and forth. And it's in that oscill oscillation. So coming back to the master list, but voting on it fresh you know, adding some things and seeing what other things rise to the top and expecting that even though like there's the same bit in there. And th this is, I think, what we discover in the um, the agreement circle where we're always talking about the same thing. And we're often noting how we keep coming back to the same agreements. But sometimes one particular agreement, one particular aspect right at the center and it takes up all the attention and then it fades away and something else takes its place. And then sometimes it comes back in. So there's this, you know, this, this um, both and in there, there's stability and change at the same time. And I feel like that's, um, that's a really, how do you keep that alive, right? You know, that's like, I think that's the, the, the magic sauce or whatever they call it. Um, so yeah, and I agree. I think it was enjoy. I, and I also agree with. Um, I too was surprised at how kind of quickly and coherently the criteria came together. And there, yes, that'll will there'll be some you know evolution that'll happen there too. But it was at a higher level than I would have expected, given how much time we spent on it. Yeah, you know something really popped out. Something was emergent in that. So. Um, yeah, actually, I think that was just a long-winded ditto. So uh, over to you, Roland. I think I'm just going to reflect on something. Um, it was a good example of how there is something new and different for me to process through ideas in a circle or a format. I'm going to change a circle format into Sangha. Um, uh, and uh, I've had I've had spiritual teachers and academic teachers and all sorts of different types of teachers, and there was always a teacher and a student. And I think that there's a value in that that kind of relationship. And what is different about processing in a circle slash sangha is that the teacher is the collective. Um, it is what it gets built from uh, uh, sharing in common. And that feels like a real gift um, and something really unusual. Um, and also a practice um, because it's not something that we're used to and um it is 
uh, anyway, I think I'm going to, I'm just going to ramble on about it. I think I've made my point. I think it's useful. I think it's, it's, it's a new way of doing things or at least one way that, uh, that, um, the dominant culture and I'm in, I am implicated in the dominant culture is used to doing things. And I feel like we, we get teachings um, uh, that comes out of this third thing that we, we, we co-create this, this kind of space that we create. Uh, so, and I'm a big fan of two rounds because um uh, especially if if for the person who goes first gives them an opportunity to be able to feed into this third thing that we're creating um so uh so we've done our two rounds for this uh i think i also want to offer um i would like to do things in two rounds and at the end of the, of the round if there's anything that anyone would like to add I encourage you to use the little either the reaction button to put your hand up or physically put your hand up and then we can we can continue we can do another round with that um so uh uh with that um uh I think uh are, we're moving on to the next item which is um uh, the general reflection on lessons learned for this past season um, for the Heartwood Guild. And we were thinking specifically about, in terms of the definition and responsibilities, but I think we can, if we want to, we can open that up just for general reflection, reflecting on the reflections that we made last at the last meeting. Um, so um we can start the circle with april if you'd like or should we should we start with ben this time start with april it's okay with me um can you can you rephrase the question for me i got lost in it somehow so the uh, the this next item is the um reflections and on lessons learned of about the heart word heart work killed definitions and responsibilities okay well first of all i think that the conversation that we've just had is definitely you know lessons learned for trying to do things in this way um and it was something new i mean one of the lessons learned from it is that we can try stuff that's pretty new and uh, something really interesting will happen of that. So I think that's just an encouragement. It takes a little courage to, to leap in. Um, and this process for me, certainly, and from what I'm hearing from others, is was an encouraging one. Um, now, what we have learned for this whole guild, for the whole season, is is more than that. But this, and probably the agreement circles, although I haven't been privy to what's happened with that, um, are examples of trying to do things using the fundamentals of heart work. So I think you know, that's more than a worthwhile experiment, I would say. I'm not sure exactly what the results of the experiment are. And that's that's it. On to bed. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I... I'm aware, I, how do I want to say this, that it's really difficult to have this conversation in a, it, it, it's the both and about how do you have a conversation within a guild that is necessarily going to affect the other guilds. Yeah. And it makes sense to have the conversation here, but then how do you link it to the other conversations that are happening 
in the other guilds, hopefully, or how do you make sure that a similar conversation is happening in the other guilds? Um, and, I, and I think we've got the structure for it. I think actually, and that is underlining the value of this kind of seasonal review, um, the annual, the, the, the holonic nature of, you know, basically our, our biweekly meetings are sprints, right? So we make some decisions about what the focus of the guild work is for the next two weeks. And then we've got the seasonal reviews, which are lighter touch it, are taking a step back, but not as deep a dive as the annual. And then we've got the annual. And, um, and I think that that's really valuable. And, but it's also, I think, I'm, I'm sorry if this is, I'm rambling because I'm thinking out loud. And so um, one of the things that I've noticed for myself is that we kind of do some seasonal planning kinds of questions. And then there's this long echo period where, or, you know, or, or what's the right word? incubation it's a, there's this long incubation period that happens and so i am already like what what i'm aware of is that our last seasonal review which we're we're kind of in the middle of our season now and i am starting to think about our next seasonal review right like i'm actually starting to anticipate what are some things we need to wrap up yet in this season so that we're ready for next season. You know, I'm thinking about January, which I think is really useful. And and it's also, but it's the both end of it. You know, it's kind of like, well, and we're not there yet, but it's still on the radar. And I think that that's valuable and also a kind of, I think a little bit what Roland was saying, it's an unusual way in our, uh, in the dominant culture, we want to keep everything neatly contained. And this is much more about, you know, there's some really messy boundaries, very broad boundaries between, and in some ways, the seasonal planning from last season and the seasonal planning for, for next season never stop. Um, yet there's a change in how it, in what it looks like. Um, so I think there are a whole bunch of things in there and I'm just going to, leave it at that and hopefully it makes more sense when we come back around so over to you Rulai. um yeah i kind of wish i was better at note taking because um i want i would have liked to have taken notes on what you were just saying <laughs> um well and i think yeah, so we are talking about the value of circle process, and that fits into one of our purviews for the guild, which is facilitation. Um, and I am wondering about um, communicating to the other guilds the these this type of thing because not everyone um uh, in the other guilds is party to these types of conversations not all of the other guilds have these types of conversations and would there be value in having like a, a, not a newsletter but like a a mini newsletter um uh and not not really it's more like a like a um, sharing reflections or something like that, um, because it could be an interesting way to, um, uh, without without a guild member having to be on in each of the other guilds, it could be a way of keeping the other guilds kind of keeping in their awareness how they're having the meetings and what's you know maybe helping to tease out what's what's actually happening or our observations on what's happening something like that so it's sort of heart heart work work 
yeah, that's my re my reflection, I suppose. Uh, so over to April. Thank you. Um, I was thinking some along the same lines. I was wondering if there wasn't like a procedure sheet or something to pass to other guilds. And I wasn't clear on what systems they were using, but I'm assuming this, that our system, I think is quite fundamental and important. The other thing, and, and I mean that we could just give structural things, try this, try this, try this, try this, or we could give some other way of, of doing an experiential uh, set of things. Um, the other thing that I was reflecting on as I was listening to Ben and also to you, Roland, was that certainly I'm getting better at seasonal thinking. And although it's kind of been in the background of how I do things for quite a long time, I've never identified it as such. And I'm understanding that it works real well, actually, for me and for what I do. Um, but initially it started well when I was being a farmer person and when, when it was practical things, seasonal things that needed to be happening as well as to be anticipated, as well as to be cleaning up from. So, you know, that cycle was always going on there linked, pretty clearly linked to different seasons. I've translated that into my sitting at the desk work that I do in some ways. I just haven't called it that. And now with the guild work, it's coming into its own in terms of my understanding of how uh, of how useful it is and that it does contain all those elements that Ben was talking about. So I think as much as all of us probably need to know how to do a bit of strategic thinking, if there's some way that we can inculcate seasonal thinking in there along with how do we look at our own biases thinking and I might have said this before you know I have a huge chart in my other room that's got all the possible psychological biases you can have and every two weeks I set myself down in front of it and say which ones have I fallen into this time and just being able to map, I guess, my biases, uh, lets me make decisions on what I want to work on. And I don't just feel overwhelmed. I feel very human, but I don't feel overwhelmed. It gives me somewhere to start. It's kind of like a little stepladder, a little short stepladder into something else, into leveling off somehow. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say over to Ben. <laughs> yeah, I think um, this is all making, well, there's a, a couple thoughts um, that this is bringing up for me. One is um, change logs and the difference between how to and how I and or how we. Yeah. And um, I think one of the articles that I've had bouncing around in the back of my head is probably a really short one, but it is the fundamental difference that happens. And I think actually, Rolan, it reminds me of what you're talking about in terms of the Sangha teaching as opposed to a teacher and students, you know, um, because there's something about sharing, here's what's working for me and why it works. Here's what I've tried. Here, what, here's what seems to work. Here's where I'm still struggling. Yeah. The, the being able to kind of put that out there, you get as a, and you know, and I've been on the other side of receiving people who are trying to convince me that I should do it that way. And I instantly have resistance. <laughs> you know, the minute you start telling me this is what I should do, I am not as open as I could be. The minute you are talking about what you're excited about, I get really enthusiastic and I start to think, oh, well, I wonder what I can do. You know, it's it's um, there's just a fundamental difference in my experience 
of the advice. And it makes it Roland's grandmother's advice. We use this all the time of take what's useful and leave the rest behind. And I think that that's the one of the hard things when people are trying to sell you a way of doing it, you feel like you've got, it's like, I don't want to do all of that. You know, there might be some ideas here that are okay, but I don't want to do your whole thing. And, and really being it offered up as, um, you know, here's what we like, that it's not our job in the heart work guild to tell other guilds how to have meetings. Right. But, Hey, we just figured out that when we do this, we get this unexpected plus and we're really excited. We're so excited. We are now making that part of our, how we do things. So, you know, here's what, here's the change we're making, why we made it and why we're excited about it. Have you had a similar thing, you know, or let us know if you have questions, we'd love to talk about it. But, you know, it's, it's like, there's some, so I think it's something about, and what Roland was saying, how do we kind of share, how do we have that venue where we can say, here's what I'm excited to talk about. Um, and, um, and I think that that's, you know, we already have spaces where that can happen, like yeah. on the newsletter. There's no reason, I think this would be a great addition to the newsletter to, you know, actually have, um, you know, success stories, you know, or exciting potentials. You know, here's the experiment that I'm about to run and I'm really, I'm really excited by it. And, and if anyone wants to, you know, be an accountability buddy, come join me or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm not, I think that that is, I think that's something to figure out, how, you know, how does, how does that keep going? Um, where does that live? Um, but it feels really powerful. Um, so over to you, Roland. Uh, so that was two rounds. And um, uh, if there is nothing to add, and you always have the option of lifting your hand if you want to, if you want another round, I would suggest that we do a round to see um, if we feel like there's anything to pull out of this as action. Uh, so, uh, if you would, if you would start us off April and I apologize, uh, my timing means that I am, I am taking care of the next stage stage of bread making. So I'm going to be moving around a little bit. And that's important. Yep. Bread is the staff of life. So it's a life giving activity that you're engaged in. Um, well, out of this comes, how do we, how do we share that? And which of the opportunities that Ben talked about, uh, should we start with? Um, and I'm just interested for almost anybody else that's involved with the Academy to, to, to just say, what does seasonal thinking mean to you? Um, see what people come up with. See if people want to talk about this. Uh, those would be my next steps. The, and also to, to publish somewhere what our learnings are. I mean, we, we have some rich learnings here. Maybe picking, you know, what are your top three great things that we learned the season, seasonal learnings of the heart work folks, um, sharing that somewhere. Over to Ben. Well, and that just seems like a really, um, the obvious question is where? Yeah. And how it's two parts, where and how do we support it happening? Yeah. Because we have been floating some balloons regularly about people doing more writing. And so far, I'm the one who writes. And um, uh, so how how do we make sure that that is happening? And 
and where where does it happen um yeah i feel like those are and the only other takeaway i would have is um an invitation to um Well, actually, there's two other things that I think I would put on the list. One is a reminder um, at the coordination circle yeah. to talk about overlaps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, gaps and overlaps. Because I, I, I tried to do a little grid the other day thinking about what are the activities and which guild is responsible for the activities. And most of them, there's an obvious home and there's a few where I don't know who actually is responsible for it. And that's a problem. So um, uh, I think having that conversation and then um, what are the supports? Yeah. Yeah, um, over to you, Roland. Well, uh, supports and structures. I was wondering, um, is there a way of, I think one of them, uh, something to talk about is, I think we've started to talk about form. In what form do, does this communication happen from, I heard, from uh, and paraphrasing to double check at the same time from April that um, one way to do it is to ask a question to encourage engagement, you know, exchange. So you, does this happen in the form of an email and social media at, uh, at other guild meetings? Um, and then uh, I also heard as a possibility, um, uh, the blurbs, I'm gonna call them blurbs, uh, uh, blurbs about observations, like the one that we had about the, the how, how circle is uh, uh, sort of the, the Sangha building its own teachings, that kind of thing. So, so, and, and, uh, So those are the two things that I heard, and they both make a lot of sense. Um, uh, so then that would be um, that would be the structure, and then there's the support, might not support anyway, can't remember the words that I used. Uh, so I was wondering, well, okay, so then the question always is who? There's these things that we're proposing to do, and then who does them? And uh, and what I would propose for that is having kind of a, I don't know if I'm using the expression properly, so a round robin schedule, so that it that that it is the uh, guild members of the heart work heart work who will take on writing a little blurb on uh, a heart worky type thing, and it can become. Part of our um, our uh, bi-monthly uh, guild circles, it would could be talking about what the next thing that we want to talk about. It could be, or it could just be whatever. It could be left to um, uh, the person whose turn it is to write the blurb. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I guess I've asked more questions than I have proposed action items. Um, I, I <laughs> yeah. think I've lost myself with the smell of yeast. Um, so, yeah, I've got possibilities. So then, it, it, and it, it could be um, that we table this until the next. um uh hard work guild meeting and um yeah so i will um uh do we do we want to 
do we want to comment and uh, do any more reflection any more yeah okay so yeah do you do you do let's popcorn this around uh april is there anything that you want to say before yeah you can tell by the way my mouth is opening and shutting <laughs> Um, I, I want to go back to, to Ben's uh, observation that he keeps floating balloons and then they float off across the horizon and apparently deflate and go somewhere else. I, I want to refloat the balloons. I want either the same balloons reinflated or new balloons that are then released into wherever balloons get released into or just tied to something. Maybe they don't even have to be released. Um, and they could even be like hot air balloons that people ride in. And so you could decide which balloon you want to ride in with who, um, just to lighten the load a bit. And the other thing is somehow in my mind, it's saying mix this up with a cocktail hour. Like have a cocktail while you're riding in this hot air balloon with me, because here's what's on the name of my balloon. And I want to talk about it with you so that's what's been in my head um i also find that i'm really i mean i could write a million jillion things and i've got a whole bunch of stuff churning around in there it's not the problem of, of knowing what to write or even where to write it i don't have time to i've got three unwritten things on my desk from two weeks ago. So I'm not getting to the bits that I want to write. Um, so I'm not quite sure what to do about that because the motivation is there, but the the actuality of doing it, it's not going to happen. And I'm just going to feel like a non-writer or a bad writer or a bad promiser. Um, so I have to think about that. Over to Ben. And I think that's, uh, I think you're, um, I like the round robin. I, I, you know, ultimately I think nothing gets done if there's no deadline. And if there's no reason to have a deadline, it has to be a meaningful deadline. Yeah. And there has to be, unfortunately, there has to be some risk of embarrassment for it to have any weight, you know, there has to be some consequence to doing or not doing something. And I think that's where floating balloons, um, you know, that's, I don't know, I don't think it matters if you tie them down or offer hard air rides or they're, they float. And that, and that's the problem with floating the balloons is they just float away. Um, so I feel like there's something about tying it to a well and i think it's also invoking reciprocity here where it's about you know there's there's um there's the same amount of time all the time it's a question of where you put your focus mm -hmm. and you know like you're always saying april you've got to be able to put some things aside to make space for other things and or do we do it in a way where we're tapping into already existing things? You know, like if it's tied to, um, I'm just thinking, you know, if it be if there's a round robin where every guild is responsible for a post at each of the newsletters, like one guild is featured per newsletter. The newsletters are every other week. There's five guilds, that's 10 weeks. So each guild would be responsible for one blurb every 10 weeks, um, which is almost every almost one a quarter. And there could even be a gap. So one a quarter, you're writing a blurb. It's not a big deal. And especially if it was something like tied to the seasonal review in the guild, and you agree as a guild, here are the three things that we're going to write up. Because, you know, the biggest problem for me in writing often is it's not having the ideas or working through the ideas. It's which one, you know, mm -hmm. it's more, it's more a question of like, 
what needs to get written. And if you give me four bullet points and, you know, a 500 word count, I can have that done in a half an hour, right? You know, it's just not a big deal. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how and where does this go, actually, because I think what we're talking about is beyond the Heartwork Guild. Yeah. So what I am going to suggest as an action item is that we treat this as a formal proposal from Heartwork to the coordination circle. Good. And um, we figure out how we would write that up. What is the proposal? And um, so that's our action item is uh, preparing a proposal. Um, or at least considerations, you know, it's sort of like maybe, and maybe there's a, a, maybe we want to invent some more language for our process where we can say, what is, what, when you, when you invoke a gathering considerations process, it's not a proposal, what are you doing? Um, but I think anyhow, that's, uh, I've gone on too long. So I will pass over to Roland. So this was very interesting because I thought we were starting off by the Heartwork Guild making a blurb. And uh, I think it is a, a, a really good idea to invite the other guilds to also put in a blurb. If it's going to go in the newsletter, then it is representing the different guilds. Um, and, you know, once a, a run robin of five different guilds makes it less onerous um for each guild to to uh, supply something um so i i agree let's bring it to the coordination circle um and i also wanted to say if there are suggestions that are made in terms of action items or things we could do and um and there is no time to do it not none of us have to take it on you know if we don't have time to do something, then some, it, then it's either deciding if it replaces something else or we just don't do it. So I, I think just to take the pressure off of when suggestions are made, we don't necessarily have to do it. Um, all right. So we've got some action items here. Um, uh, and so if we're, and it is, we still have, uh, wait a minute. It's an hour. We started at two. So we are actually 15 minutes over. Um, are there, is there anything, do, do we want to take the extra 15 minutes to talk about badges or do we want to do a closing round? April and Ben, how do you feel? Uh, I need to go. So a closing round would be great. Well, and I want to um I want to reiterate that we spent 20 minutes opening up the over 20 probably 25 minutes before we did any work and if we're going to spend that long then an hour long meeting is um doesn't work um and um so I think uh and and we're at the end of our time, so I, I don't know wh what to do with this, but um, I think it would have been nice to be able to talk about badges because that actually starts to turn a lot of this um, vague sounding language into what are our responsibilities as a guild and what, like you were saying, Roland, we can say no to some things, but what are we actually saying yes to and what are we making commitments to? So, and I think that's where the badges come in because that's really supposed to be what are what's the work that we are making sure happens um and uh and i'm okay with the closing round and and i also my understanding is always that it's an hour to 90 minutes it's kind of a you know a loose target but um that might be something good to clarify about if we are really trying to keep things to an hour um then that would change my strategy on how i spend my time
So uh, back to you, Roland. Uh, and uh, so uh, point taken about the 20 minutes at the beginning. Uh, and I would like to uh, offer, uh, well, there's the, the all y'all facilitate, facilitators um, often have amounts of time that you allot for different sections. And I would, I would volunteer to um, make up a proposal for amounts of time for the different parts at the beginning of the meeting uh, to uh, to float by you more experienced folks, and uh, and it could be really interesting actually to see what what how can we fit how can we fit in the bits and pieces that we feel are important in in you know how much time so. That's that's a, I'm proposing to do that. And popcorn, just whatever. I I have concerns about that. Um, I think that the um, it's a balance between you know if we try to make if we try to cover everything, every meeting, then everything will have to be abbreviated to the point where we can't really do much of anything in a meaningful way. So better in my mind that we would have some system where we could maybe some days we go more into the agreements and some days we go more into the purpose and some days we go more into the check-in, but we don't do all four of those in depth every time. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then how, how we choose, you know, eventually I think I don't, I think variety is the spice of life. And I don't think that there's a, a magic ratio of how often to talk about purpose versus agreement versus whatever. Um, but anyhow, I, I, I also recognize that having some uh, parameter, like we don't want to spend more than five minutes on the intro is also useful. And um, so those are my thoughts. It's useful to have some timestamps and you also have to figure out how to be able to go with the flow because every meeting is going to be a little different. And we're popcorning. So any, but April, if you have anything to add, just type, chime in. Um, just to say that I think, yeah, the key is the balance and when it's appropriate to have more about one thing or more about another. So we can either do that at the beginning of each meeting or have a system where we say, you know, over this many meetings, we want to do this, this, and this in terms of the balance and then see how that goes and whether we're moving through the work. And there absolutely are, are times that we need to have a more intact and deeper discussion. And there are times when we just need to have a bullet point or highlight uh, presented somehow and also because we are the Hartward Guild, we need to pay attention to, are we demonstrating and modeling what it is that we're watching for the vibes of in our own, in our own work? In any case, I need to go now. Okay. Um... Any last words for the good of the cause? Are we, we're back in circle. Um, Cesora. What? Cesora. It's the ellipsis. <laughs> the the dot 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 or oh, the right, right, or right, the right. musical um, pause. Right. right. Okay. So that's my, my last thought, my last word for the good of the cause. All righty. Well, um, uh, till next time, over to you, April. Um, last words, thank you for this time together. And uh, I, I, we've got some real good stuff here and I'm gonna wanna look at it before the next meeting and redigest it, I think. Anyway, thank you. That's it. All right. Goodbye, all. Bye-bye. See Bye. you soon.